Shalom to each of you here on the Zoom call and those who will watch this class lecture on YouTube later. I hope you'll feel welcome and when this section ends in about 20-25 minutes that you'll be a participant in the rest of the questions and discussion time. This letter to Messianic Jews was written before the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Today we study chapter 6 and if you haven't yet read it, please, those of you on YouTube, Pause the playback, read the chapter, and then press play again to rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. Today we dig into this chapter, which features some of the basics of Messianic faith, and also considers the assurance that every believer should have about making it to the end in the hands of God. I hear from believers all too regularly about their lack of assurance, in other words, their fear that they will not make it into heaven. As we approach the high holidays, this is one of the great facts for us, that assurance is real and available if we put our trust in Yeshua. More on that today and down the track. I wish the chapter division between chapters 5 and 6 didn't exist. The thoughts at the end of 5 roll immediately into 6, but what we have is what we'll have, and we'll have to use it to assist us. The chapter begins in verse 1 with a, so then. Uh, the linkage is clear. Given what chapter 5 said, let's do something. What does the author want from us? To leave behind elementary principles, or to realize we've already covered all those, and thus we need to press on. Yes, the second option. I used to be a high school mathematics teacher. I'm not saying that to solicit tutorials for your children sitting their HSC, but to highlight progressive learning. When students learned to count by whole numbers, one, two, three, etc., that was arithmetic. Adding them one by one was fundamental to experiencing the joys of arithmetic. But it's also foundational to knowing mathematics. Without the basics, you can't multiply fractions, you can't solve for variables, you can't use differentials and calculate area and volume correctly. Basics matter. When the author says leaving in verse 1, I believe what is meant is, since we've already covered all that, let's leave discussion about that and move on to other things. Not in the sense of abandonment, but rather as leaving the information in place. Well, we see six doctrines that are fundamental to the believer that the author is sure that each of the Messianic Jews has previously learned. Let me say just now that if you are unsure about any of these six, that you should take time this week before and after the D groups to ensure that you have those down. I want to help you if you need. If you belong to a community of faith, please ensure you and the rabbi or pastor are in sync with these doctrines. They're important for you to know so that you can pass them on to your future D group, as others ask. They break down into three groups of two. First, the believer and the Lord, just now. This covers basics one and two, and they are repentance, and faith. Let's talk about those. Repentance is first. It was John the Baptist's message as he began. It was Yeshua's first sermon. It was Peter's sermon on Shavuot in Acts chapter 2. Two weeks from today, the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah will take place and begin the 10 days of repentance. We have to know that to begin well well, to begin well is to self-criticize, not self-condemn. That's why it's repentance from dead works, literally works of death, ergon necros. Not everything we did in life before our coming to faith is bad, and not everything we do as a believer is authentic and well represents the Lord. The call by the author is to remind us that dead works are those things that we employ so that God favors us. They are religion. They're religious attempts at currying God's love. That's empty and vain. It's useless, and we need to repent of that system and those efforts in it. When you repent, your heart is then opened 
to being filled again. And that's why faith toward God is the natural follow-on. Yeshua said in Mark 1, repent and believe the gospel. Faith is the available consequence to repentance. If you can imagine it, we dump out the bad beverage from our cup and can now refill the cup with proper attitudes and actions. The writer will unpack an entire tome of Older Testament characters who live this out in the 11th chapter. Repentance leads to faith. Paul told the Ephesian elders, Acts chapter 20, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Paul taught publicly, like our Zoom classes, and house to house, like our D groups, that all people should repent and enable faith in Yeshua. The second of these three groups is the believer with the community of faith. This covers basics three and four. Third is baptisms. I know some versions of your Bible might say washings, and those would have been standard in Jewish understanding related to the mikveh, but the word here is from the Greek directly, baptism, baptism, and it means to cause to dip. It's early stuff for believers. Yeshua was baptized. All the new believers were as well, Acts chapter 2, 8, 10, 19. If you in this class are a believer and have not yet been baptized, before the next week, let's get you organized to do so. If you don't live in Sydney, please find a believer locally who can perform this. Yeshua said at the end of Mark's gospel, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. There's no room for I'll do that later. It's a sign of membership and acceptance. You don't want to walk away from that. This week, I went to a funeral of Jerry, a 90-year-old Irish Jew who got saved a few years ago here. I enjoyed baptizing him in Ezra's pool shortly after that. Almost the day, in another case, Shurov got saved. This young man was going into Bondi Beach with me to battle the waves and to get baptized. It doesn't make a Jew into a non-Jew. It makes a Jew obedient to the Lord's command. Fourth is laying on of hands. That has many features biblically, including arresting criminals, like in Acts 21, and bringing about healing in Yeshua's day. But in context here in Hebrews, I believe it's about the ordination of priests and overseers. Acts 13, 1 Timothy 4. Paul said in 1 Tim 5, not to lay hands on someone too suddenly. Of course, this time of year, I'm always thinking of laying hands on the animals of sacrifices during Yom Kippur as we consider high holidays. And either could be in view here. Why do I know that? Because of what follows in the next few chapters. The author is setting up a clear distinction between Older Testament people and guidelines against the New Covenant way of understanding. So laying on of hands could mean either the transfer of sins or ordination of elders. In either case, the believers reading this letter originally would have certainly been aware of the lessons, and so should you. This covers basics five and six. Fifth is resurrection of the dead. This is so fundamental to the first century believer, but rarely covered in basic doctrine classes today. Without the resurrection, Yeshua is still dead and buried. Without the resurrection, we have no kingdom. Jewish beliefs in the coming of Messiah require that there be a resurrection that would have already taken place. No wonder Matthew records this, that when the veil of the temple was torn, Matthew 27, that the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city. Paul records much about the resurrection and its significance in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's fundamental to believers and should be for you as well. 
Finally, the author brings up eternal judgment. This certainly doesn't go down well in modern conversation, but it's essential information for a foundations class. This doctrine came to the forefront along with the resurrection in the intertestamental period. But by the time of the writing of the Newer Testament, the formulation was set. Believers went to a reward after they die. Unbelievers don't. Yeshua himself spoke more about hell than anyone else in the entire Bible. Most people today would say hell, that's reserved for the likes of Hitler and Stalin, and maybe Martin Bryant, who killed 35 down at Port Arthur in 1996, or the policeman who murdered George Floyd with the knee on his neck for over eight minutes. They even used the words, the, the phrase, pure evil to describe such people. <clears throat> Most would say that everyone else should be allowed into heaven, or at least the folks in my world should get a pass. But the Bible makes this judgment business clearer and completely impersonal. Daniel 12 verse 2 showcases the idea that eventually won out in the end, that the length of time for heaven was the same as the length of time for all those punished in hell. <clears throat> all six of those elementary basics and uh, should be the bases of continuing in the faith. That's where the next section takes us, and I call it warning number five in this book, out of six. This is where some people really miss an overarching theme of the whole Bible. The assurance for believers is locked in, even though we often are tempted to and warned against backsliding. God wants us to know him and to be sure of his love and care. Listen, Yeshua said this in John 10, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. This is in the section where Yeshua is calling himself the good shepherd. He goes on and says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who's given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. The writer of Hebrews is not writing to make us wonder or doubt. That's not the intention of any biblical writer. The author is writing to strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that hang down. Therefore, in context of the entire Bible and the echo of Yeshua, we read verses four to eight. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have made, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again are crucifying to themselves the Son of God and are putting him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. How do I dismiss this as not teaching eternal insecurity? There are several reasons, most notably by reading verses 9 and 10. We'll get to that in a moment. I think this change that the author uses from we and you, which, he's, which the author has been using, to those sounds like the author is creating a scenario that doesn't really exist, but could. Suppose I said there are those who used to walk with us. That's, that's what it sounds like to me. And especially as the author returns to you and me in verse 9. Listen up, verse 9. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. The word accompany is the Greek word echo. Though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. What's impossible in verses four to eight is that another person can stimulate another to repentance. I can't do that to my kids, to my cousins. 
I can't do that. It's impossible, verse 6, for me to try to fix you. But it's not impossible for God to bring others back to himself. That's why we pray. We pray to him. God, do stuff. Organize situations. Help them come back to you. That's why we have a great high priest whom we can ask to repair things and to repair people. Nothing, ha, hallelujah, nothing is impossible with God. And the author is highlighting the power of God, not the power to reject God by mankind. Listen to these words the author uses to, that, that follow. Hope, promises, anchor. Each one carries enough juice to help me drink in the tough times of my own irresponsibility and fallenness. I can turn back to God and find him because he's made promises. Verse 12, 13, 14. And as a result, in verse 19, I have hope. And that hope, he says, is an anchor of my soul. That means nothing can shake me away from this anchor. And now don't think of an anchor, a vertical anchor that's planted in the depths of the ocean, but rather in the heights of heaven. God wants us to have real and sincere hope, not wishful thinking, but biblical hope. That's the eternal longing in a believer to be with God, to live in his presence, no matter the discipline required, no matter the rejection by others. Hope that the return of Yeshua will establish his kingdom soon. On what do we base that hope? On the promises of God. He made those promises to Abraham in verse 13 and following. And then to those who have faith like Abraham, who become heirs of those promises. That's you, that's me. Our hope will not disappoint because it's not based on us and our performance or lack of performance. It's based on the love of God in Yeshua. That's where my hope is, hallelujah. Verse 18, it's God who cannot lie. So what he has said, he'll perform. God cannot lie. And I love this. In verse 18, the word is impossible. It's the same word that's used in verse 6. It's contrasted clearly. The impossible of verse 6 is contrasted with the impossible of verse 18. God cannot lie. So it's impossible for someone to be eternally lost who has come to faith in Yeshua. Live there, not in your own experience, if you know someone who might be in your mind who's fallen away. Live in the promise of God. Yeah, there are warnings. And those remain to keep us on the straight and narrow. And that series of warnings reminds us to keep our hand to the plow and not to look back. The warnings are not designed to scare us it causes to fear or live in insecurity. They're there to help us know there are consequences to going backwards. There's nothing in the book that tells us we're going to lose our salvation, but there's enough in the book to remind us that if we want to live a heavenly life today on planet Earth, we ought to heed the warnings. In other words, life is better, the author says, with Yeshua as the center of our lives. What did Yeshua pray in his high priestly prayer? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yeshua the Messiah, whom you have sent. What then, in verse 18, are these two unchangeable things? Most interpreters see that as the promise, Genesis 22, to Abraham and then all that follow. And the oath, we've already seen that, Psalm 110, and we're going to see that a lot more starting next week with Melchizedek, this oath I've sworn, sworn by nobody else. God says he's sw <laughs> sworn by, he couldn't find anybody bigger, so he swore by himself. Now, those are the two things, and I have no problem with that. In context, these make great sense. But I like to think of two others. Maybe this will help you in this context. I think these demonstrate security and hope for those who are needy. First was the altar where they committed, to, where they performed sacrifices outside the tabernacle. And second are those six cities of refuge in the land of promise, three outside, three inside. 
The altar is the place where a person could flee who felt he was in danger. Adonijah did that in 1 Kings chapter 1. I, I wonder if you ever played a game of tag or whatever you called it in your home country where you would run around and run around, but you created a home base somewhere. And as long as you touched that, you were safe. Then somebody would go chase and you'd run away from home, but you could always come back to home and that was safe. You were safe there. Well, that's what Adonijah did. It says he feared Solomon. So he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Hmm. Adonijah probably thought, well, how could anyone do evil against me if I'm in the place where sacrifice takes place and forgiveness is extended? That place, however, was not always able to protect people. In the next chapter of 1 Kings, it highlights Joab's run to home base, but there he was killed. This was one of two home base situations that I find in the Bible. The other is called the cities of refuge. There were six such cities, three east of the Jordan, three west. They're described in detail in Numbers chapter 35. It was to one of those that a person could flee if they accidentally killed a fellow Israelite until a proper court could be set up and the case tried judiciously and calmly. This prevented vigilante justice. It's possible the author of Hebrews is calling on either or both of those images, especially when he talks about, uh, when, sorry, when the author talks about um, taking hold of it and running to, it just sounded to me like these were possible images. Uh, either way, the point is clear. Be sure. God has your back. He's yours and you are his. How do I know that? Because Yeshua, last verse, is our forerunner and he wants us to hear the echo of salvation. Dear friends on Zoom or on YouTube, if you don't yet know Messiah Yeshua, please, I appeal to you today, surrender your life to him. Admit your need of him. Trust him who came from heaven to earth to show the way and to set you free. That's, that's faith. If you want to talk more about that, start with prayer. Talk to the Almighty. He He's your city of refuge. He's the horn of your altar. I mean, you can run right to him. He loves to listen to your faintest whisper. And if you want to ask me a question, just write there at the email on the screen, and I'll give, give it a go to try to answer you. Until next week, when we will meet again to share about chapter 7 and more about Melchizedek and the one who came in his order, Yeshua, our great high priest. Until then... Shabbat Shalom.